See, I really like that opening. <laughs> that was fun to watch. Hi, how's it going? Hi, how are you? Hi, hello. Are you okay? Are you all right? Uh, it's uh, it's nice to see you. Thanks for popping on here. Kind of a, a last minute decision, something we've been thinking about doing for a long time, but honestly, it, it stems from the Strombo like conversation that we had so much. If you're new to the Strombo show, in terms of seeing me and you're only used to seeing this channel, with the concerts that we play on these uh, these pages, these episodes. Uh, that's my home in Toronto. That is where I'm from. Uh, and I have a long career in sharing music and ideas and conversations and stories and books and things like that. And that's kind of what prompted what we wanted to do today on the show. Honestly, you saw that video right there. That's just leaving the radio show and raising home. It took me about 20 five minutes to get back from the Apple Music Show. That's where I do a daily show broadcasting in 165 countries around the world. And I love that experience. I used to host a late night talk show and I don't want to host another one in the traditional sense. I don't. I would much rather just hang out with you. I love what we do on Apple and doing these Strong Boys Lit Book Clubs have been super fun. We just did one with Getty Lee. We've seen the interview on this channel for his book, My F in Life. And I was lucky enough to host his live reading an event at Massey Hall in Toronto with his uh, good friend and bandmate, his best friend, his brother, talking about Alex Life. And that was so much fun that was on this channel. And that was part of our Strong Boys Lit Book Club. And we've got a new one coming up. I'm going to announce that a little bit later on today. I'm not much for reviews. I'm not that into reading book reviews. Honestly, I'm not that into reviews generally. I like an aggregate score at, at best. But into the review scenario, I'm always very careful about what other people say because reviews are an industry and anything that becomes an industry, I don't think you can always trust it on its own. So I, uh, I'm always cognizant of what a review is where it's printed, but the reviews for this one particular book are pretty dynamite and they line up with how I feel about it. So I'm excited to announce that for you in just a little bit. But here's the thing, I've been reading this book, I've been thinking, see, I've been thinking about thinking and I know, I know thinking about thinking is dangerous. Uh, I think Neil Young said, if you're thinking, you're stinking. I believe Sebastian Bach had his own version of that. If you think you stink, and it's this idea that we can have a paralysis of, of, of thought if we overthink what we're doing. And I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be caught in that world. But I started reading this book called Being You by Anil Seth. If you don't know who Anil Seth is, he's amazing. He's a, a neuroscientist that is also a professor and an author. You may have seen his TED Talk online. His TED Talk is pretty incredible. I think 14 and a half million views or something like that. And the, you know, the idea of what is consciousness and who are you, what is your brain is a fascinating one. And so he wrote all about it in this new book. So this isn't an official Strombo's Lit selection where we would all read it together and then get on a live stream and talk about it. But at the same time, I thought it was just amazing to, to sit back and explore this book and explore this conversation because our book club can kind of be all kinds of things. And I've seen lots of memes floating around online about what a book club is and, and how they could be. But I like ours because ours is a bit weird. You know, ours is a bit weird. So you can hear me better now? Great. I'm just doing it live. I'm just doing it live from the house. What I was saying is that thinking is paralyzing for a lot of people and overthinking is paralyzing. This idea that the Neil Young quote that I had said that if you're thinking, you're stinking, meaning you kind of just got to flow with it. And and the more we learn about the human brain, the more we explore it together on social media, which is super dangerous and can be very beautiful, but also incredibly misleading, uh, it can put us into dangerous places, right? And so I, I, I'm constantly fascinated by consciousness because what is it? Who knows what all this stuff is? And that's what I wanted to do today was just kind of get in and talk a little bit. So we're going to have a full Anil Seth interview coming up on our YouTube channel on Friday morning. We're going to post it on Friday morning, but I want to play a little clip of it uh, for you today. It's a really great read. Absolutely, it is. So we'll get into that. The show today, uh, the Apple Music show was fun. It was you know, our first show in the month of April for this year, um, or yesterday was, and our second show today we wanted to focus on some new bands that we thought you might like. There's some really great ones, by the way. I don't know if you can, if you if you're able to hear the show or not, but there's this one particular band uh, that I love on the show. They're called Bob Villain. There's a they have a new record called Humble as the Sun. We've played a few songs off this um, artist over the show. I can't play it on you on this for you now because if I do that, then we'll violate a copyright law and then the record labels or the publishers or somebody will come tackle us in the home. So I can't play it for you, but you can find it on the Strombo podcast. So the Strombo podcast is on your Apple podcast. By the way, the show is not sponsored by Apple, but they pay for that show. And I'm grateful to have that opportunity. I don't do it by myself, by the way. I do it with this handsome fella right over here. Can we see him? Hey, Bobby, uh, you're uh, on camera. How are you? Can you hear me? Let's get your mic audio up here. 
Can you hear me? There, I got you loud Can you hear and clear. Me? So yeah, so All who right. who did we play on the show today? Like it's some of the newer artists that we focused on, pretty good ones. We did English Teacher, who are a band from Leeds, and we did Gustav, who's a band from Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and then we also just played some new music from some classic acts like Black Keys, got a new record coming out, and Vampire Weekend. It's good. It was a good mix. It was like. Uh, it's like our show. It's like, it's like That's what we show. do. Yeah, our show is our show is almost illogical in a way, right? Uh, it's an amazing team that put together this Rombo show. That's Bob Mackwitz. If you've been, if you know me at all, you know that Bob and I have been brothers and working together for for decades now. We met in the in the in the early to mid '90s. Uh, Raquel Messina, who's been a part of the House of Strombo team on this YouTube channel, she's working on the show from Toronto. In LA, we have somebody called Emmy. Emmy Quinn and Yasmin Haddad is in New York, uh, and Yasmin introduced us to the band Gustav, right? Who we totally loved. You you said how the show is illogical, but it's not. It's what I would call super illogical, and that I blame on you. I spend <laughs> most of my life trying to corral the the loose stallion that is your imagination into something that resembles an A to B to C linear line. Good luck with that. But there mm -hmm. it's just it's kind of like a higher form of logic so, so i'm going to call it super logic I, I can live with that i can live with that um bob and i spend most of our time bob and i will talk for about 90 minutes to two hours a day almost every day and i would say 25 minutes of its work because we rely on instinct and and honestly history we both have been doing this for decades uh and the rest of the conversations are around philosophy and things like that so at one point i said to him we should just turn the mics on when we do this and and kind of spend some time i know that when we do this on youtube and on facebook and other places in the very beginning it, it's not a big thing we're trying to build something kind of small and lovely and over time, I think more people will sign on board. But this is a great opportunity for you to tell your friends about what we're doing, by the way. You can always do this. You can always like, subscribe, and watch another video if you want afterwards. But uh, it's up to you. Text your friends. Tell them we're over here on the Strombo Show channel. Dude, have you eaten at all today? I have. I try to do it every day, really. I don't feel like that's all that noteworthy. By the way, this I like the fact that you brought up this booze. It was like Chekhov's gun. If you're going to bring it out in Act One, you better use it by Act Three. So you can get loaded. Well, listen, I'm, I'm breaking my fast. I haven't. I, I and listen, I'm so. Uh, this is a non-alcoholic. I don't drink. Well, I'm going to break with a non-alcoholic rum um, and also and a caffeine-free um, cola beverage. And listen, if you're one of those glucose glendas out there, don't get all up in my DMs telling me that oh, you shouldn't break your fast with a with a soft drink and a, and a fake drink. You know how hard it is to not drink in the first place? I'll take what I can. I'm a man who has very viceful heart, who has no vices in my daily life. So Bob, cheers to you. Uh, yeah, cheers to you. Uh, water, there you go. Indeed. I, I should say this. Australia, indeed. On Thursday, our, on Thursday show, what we're gonna do on the Apple Music show is celebrate Kurt Cobain. So April 5th, the day that Kurt died is on the Friday. Uh, the world finds out on April the 8th. Uh, but April the 5th is apparently when it happened. So we're not on the air on Friday, we're on the air on Thursday night. So what we're going to do is uh, do a little bit of a, a of a storytelling. Now, we've been on the air. I, my first radio show was in 1992. So I was playing Nirvana music while Kurt was still alive, but for the majority of my career, every time this weekend comes up, we're talking about his passing. We're going to do it a little bit differently, though, on the show this week, aren't we, Bob? We're going to kind of we're going to explore other voices. Uh, so much has been said, mm -hmm. and it's the 30th anniversary. It's presumptuous to think that there's a lot to add to it, but one of the things we set it to do is listen to what musicians had to say over the years about Kurt Cobain, right? right. About his passing, about his gift. Um, about what he's come to mean, what he meant then. And so really, like, and you did a beautiful job of this, but we tied together a lot of people from Pete Townsend to Henry Rollins to uh, Quest you know, Rivers Cuomo, Questlove, uh, Talib Kweli. Uh, there's just a lot of voices who describe who, uh, who Kurt was and is, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And the thing that I like about, you know what we're going to do? Oh, I hope I like it. We're doing it. But uh, we talk about Kurt's impact on a lot of really meaningful hip hop artists and how you mentioned Talib and Questlove. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of rappers talk about what Kurt meant, especially those, especially if you're a young artist in the early 90s when we were in the golden age of hip hop, the so-called golden age of hip hop, plus you had grunge going on at the same time. 
that absolutely. And I remember interviewing Dizzy Rascal in the late nineties on his first record when he came through maybe early two thousands, but he came through much music in Canada. And when he came through much music, we, um, we ended up talking to him and he talked about how Nirvana had such an impact on him, but also just Kurt Cobain specifically and the kind of artist that Kurt Cobain was. So that comes up uh, on the show when we talk about it. So that's going to be on Thursday night. If you, if you aren't not able to check us out live on our Apple Music channel, you can always get us on Apple Podcasts as the Strombo Show. You can subscribe. You can share it with your friends. You can like. You can do all these other things. If you heard the phone ring, it's because in a bit we're going to bring on somebody who I'm really excited to talk. She's a longtime friend, and, and uh, um, she's – one of my favorite earthlings earthling is a key word for her and we are going to talk about something she's been working on it just premiered at south by southwest so i'm really excited about that for those in the comments by the way who are asking what i'm drinking because i've covered up the labels i've covered up the labels because every just just too much stray advertising out there and i don't want you to catch strays on advertising i just don't like they're not paying for it if they were sponsoring the show then i would be more than happy to tell you but i can tell you that i don't drink and i haven't drank for almost 30 years this december is going to be almost 30 years so i'm one of those people who likes to take drink non-alcoholic drinks that are really close and i know that's dangerous for some people but if you want to know what it is get in my dms on one of the social media and i'll tell you what the brand is but it's uh it's spicy and it makes me feel good so it's my version of a a rum and coke i guess but you're I really playing hard to get with this drink, eh? I just don't. Like, I just you, don't you want to get a drink. You pour yourself a drink. You like go out of your way to slowly drink from it. And say, by the way, if you want to know what it is, you can DM me. Like, How hard is it to get this drink? Like seriously, George, come on. I, I don't want hey, that. Bro, I'm not, I'm not what I'm not giving free advertising. I'm, it's like we're like FC Barcelona, Bob. We're only going to do this if we're putting charities on and causes the good stuff. That's that's what I want to do. Ironically, though, we've already promoted the show twice so we are brought to us by us we're brought to us by us i think that is kind of the idea um it was kind of fun hey i don't know if you saw this bob but check this out so yesterday yesterday i uh i was on on well no i just i just switched to look at this so yesterday I, i did a hockey podcast one of the hockey podcasts that i watch all the time and it was so much fun it was so much fun. I was on the sick podcast with Tony Marinero out of Montreal. Uh, it's an English language uh, Montreal Canadiens podcast, and it was so fun. It was um, just to talk hockey again. I don't know if you know this, Bob, but for a moment in my career, I talked hockey on television. So let me get this straight. You went on camera and spoke with people about hockey. Has right. uh, that ever happened before? Never. Never. I wore different suits. I wore different suits. You know what comment I kept getting, though? was mm. how, how I look like Doug Gilmore. Really? I kept getting, do, do I, I mean, you look, you know, killer. Do I look like Doug Gilmore to you? A little bit. Yeah, I, look, I look a little bit like him. Can we, a picture of Can we bring one up for anybody who doesn't know who Doug Gilmore is? He's a yeah. hockey player and is famous. There it is. That's me rocking out right there along with it. But yes, I got a Gilmore, but this is actually better. That, that, that feels more yeah. accurate for me. You probably look a bit I, like that. I love that. Do I look like Doug Gilmore? I love it. Yeah, I love this. There you are. Right nails, why tough not? in the corners. Why not? Why not? Um, Actually, you know what? Speaking of looks, by the way, uh-huh. uh huh. have you noticed that you and I look exactly opposite? Yeah, that you're wearing a white t-shirt with black hair and I have a black shirt with white hair and that we actually look like photo negative versions of each other? When I think in actual fact, you, you're the white hat and I'm the black hat in our regular lives. So, I, mm-hmm. you know, in a weird way this should be reversed but you're you look pretty you do you do got like young evil gandalf what, what was the other guy who was the other I mean, was for gandalf, but old for a person <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of where i sit um there's uh i i want to ask you this because i want to i want to bring on our, uh someone to talk about something in just a second but okay. you're raising a, a daughter you're raising a young kid how old is yep. your kid now I know, but just turned, four, just turned 14, Georgie, just turned just, 14. Your daughter is smarter and more clever than the average bear, I believe. And I wonder what kinds of conversations you're having with your daughter, and what kinds of conversations she's having with you about climate and environmentalism and shopping practices and plastics and things like that. What's that like? Well, George, when it comes to discussing things that could be harmful, at this time, the environment has to get in line. Right. That's there's, right. Other, there's other things that have pushed their way to the front of the line. That said, though, uh, 
I can imagine. I can imagine. So the single most important thing we're dealing with is climate. That's not even first in line. When we wake up in the morning, we don't say to each other, you know what I was thinking? We've got to find a way to talk to Cece about the melting polar ice cap today. I'm a little concerned. <laughs> but what about when you go shopping? When she was a kid, were you were you making okay. choices and, and guiding her? Truth. Yeah, here's the real truth. But it's very difficult, as you know, in a society that's built around buying stuff to make a lot of environmentally slash ethically motivated decisions. You try, mm -hmm. but by the end of the day, you've already failed 50 times or, right. you know, right. it's, it's just, but when it comes to what you eat, I actually think that's really important. When it comes to health, when it comes to our place within the ecosystems, uh, trying to be responsible members of like a species alongside other species uh, that we talk about all the time about how, where meat comes from, how it's produced, how it's not necessarily wrong to eat it, but that this is what factory farming is. Mm -hmm. um, by eating less of it, you can have an impact. That kind of stuff we do talk about. And it's ultimately, you know, I mean, part of it is for the environment, obviously, but another part of it is just to be healthy, is yeah. just to teach someone to be, like, did anyone ever tell you when you were a kid how many problems you could avoid if you just kind of were a little healthy? Did anyone tell you that? Only my mom, and I wasn't listening. That That's was true. Yeah. Listen, my mom said it all the time. Harry, I'm trying to blame her, but it was my own damn fault. <laughs> it is our own damn fault. Well, the reason I, I asked you about that is because, um, I don't know if you know this, but at the end of the month in Ottawa, uh, a bunch of nations are gathering to discuss plastics. That's what they want to talk about. I know, I saw I saw a meme the other day that made me laugh. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a girl wearing a t-shirt that says, I use paper straws so that Taylor Swift can fly her jet. It was a Taylor Swift fan that was trying really hard to offset for Taylor Swift, right? And we know that plastic is this thing, but there's actually going to be a thing in Ottawa. It's what's it called? The Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee. It's like the fourth season of it. And they're trying to come up with a legally binding framework, something about regulating plastic pollution and including it in the marine environment. They're doing all this stuff. So it's it's really interesting. Let me, Bob, I'm going to pop you off for just a second, right? Because I want to bring in, I want to bring in somebody else to talk about this because she knows an awful lot about this. You, you would have seen her on the discovery of the daily planet she was a former host on that show uh, but also wrote a book called the reality bubble and at south by there was a, a movie that just played a doctor just played called plastic people let's see if we can bring her on here zaya tong hi zaya how are you hey it's great to be with you it's i'm so, so happy to be on your new show i'm lagging oh no <laughs> Light problem, George. Technical difficulties, because I can't hear you. Hang tight. Let me I can you hear back. you. Let All right, call me back. Bring Bob back on. All right, let's bring Bob back, back on. Okay. All right, we'll bring Bob back on. I think, right, we'll I think, on. I okay, think it's I, my we, new camera here. Let me just, we, let me just log off. Okay. And I'm going to try and go somewhere else now and, and call you back. I'll be right back. We could hear her more than we could hear her loud and clear, Bobby. She was right there the whole time. You're back on. You what? That was the audio version of Spinal Tap Stonehenge. But we could hear, her, so that's okay. We could hear, her, so that's okay. So she'll come back on. So here's the thing about this film called Plastic People. Uh, it's not about life in the modern world where everything is left. Okay, here we go. As I come back, it's actually about where plastic is. Okay. Can you hear us now, Zaya? I sure can. Experimental stuff is so weird, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. I love it. It throws me back to the Zed days, actually, when anything goes. So, like, here we are. Dude, I can't hear you. This is crazy. What should I do? You can hear me just fine. I can't hear you. The minute you throw Bob on, you should have Bob on and interview him. <laughs> nope. But you know what? I'll tell you what. Let's try an experiment. Why don't you call me? You have my number. And um, I'll talk to you that way. And you can see me. And then we can just chat. Does that work? Okay. Okay, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Bonkers. 
there's some glitch and I need to figure it out. Hmm. Tricky, tricky. situation. Hello, Robert. We're back now. I got Bo Zaya and Bob on here. Can you hear us now, Zaya? Yeah. What did you do? I don't know. I got you right now. Okay, great. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, let's chat then. Okay. Nope. Once you, once you throw me on at the same time as you, I lose you. Okay. We'll keep it on here because people should look at you. Um, I, I need to talk to you about plastic people because when I heard what you, I, I don't want you to give away the ending of your movie, be, uh, the documentary, but when I heard what was contained in the film, it was kind of alarming. And I, I just wanted to, 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 to bring you on just for a second as we're getting ready to talk to Anna and all about this. Can you just tell people what your film's about? For sure. Well, my film is essentially, I guess, Barbie the horror movie because it's really looking at the plastification of human society and how all the garbage, the 10 you know, billion tons of plastic that we have put out into the environment never goes away. It never really disappears. It, uh, a lot of it has been buried, but a lot of it has disintegrated into this invisible dust. And this microplastic, we are now breathing it in, we are eating it, and we are drinking it. So I went on a journey around the world and started experimenting on my own body to find out how much microplastic was in my own, I don't know if I can swear on your new show, but in my own feces <laughs> and well, also in my own blood and uh we also have a world first in this film as well so um i think you know a little bit about that yes this world first is um and let me just come back to the camera one second this world first is a bit of a problem because they have footage of something that is super alarming and what did you find can you tell us what you have or give us a hint yeah, I can share it with you. Um, we actually found plastic in the human brain for the very first time. We followed uh, two researchers, pioneering researchers and very, very well-known plastic researchers. One is a neuro-oncologist, another one is a biologist who's been looking at plastic in tissue for years now and uh, actually flew to Turkey and joined them for a brain surgery. And uh, you'll see the results, but it's pretty shocking in the film because you actually get to see what that plastic looks like in our body. And uh, so, so it's groundbreaking research, groundbreaking science, absolutely horrifying and terrifying, but it's a wake up call for everyone. So I, I hope your listeners and viewers get a chance to see the film. You know, so many people are inundated with stories and social media and news reports of what we can do to make a difference. And I understand why we need to do little things that we can do. But at the end of the day, when you look at the numbers and climate, so much of this is about industry. So, but a lot of it gets laid at the footsteps of a person who's just trying, as Bob said earlier, just trying to get it together for their family. What do you, what do you do in this situation? Well, we in this film made it very clear that we were not putting the onus on the individual. I traveled all the way to Manila where there are places that are just, just. I mean, when you see it, you, you probably haven't even seen that much plastic in your life because in places like Manila, things are sold in tiny packages of plastic because it's cheaper. So at the end of the day, it's a system-wide problem. You can't put it on the individual, right? Mm -hmm. So and just like it's the same thing as kids. We don't want to be like, hey, kids, just like we do with the climate. Now it's your your turn to clean everything up. <laughs> That's absolutely not the strategy here. So, you know, <laughs> one of the big things is, you know, the policymakers, um, you know, showing this to the people who are going to be making a difference, all those delegates, all those ministers who are going to be attending the plastics treaty. And then also at other levels, right? Corporate levels. These are the people who are actually making this SHIT and put mm -hmm. and pumping it out there really, really needlessly. Think about all the people who are making bottled water. We all know that they're selling plastic. They're not mm -hmm. actually selling water even. And then you think of, you know, companies that are making all of that fast fashion. All of that is plastic. So it's kind of like punch buggy in the beginning. You know that game where when you when you see a when you see like a red VW, you start yeah. to see them everywhere. Yeah. Now 
I see plastic everywhere because plastic is in our paint. Plastic is in chewing gum. Plastic is in cigarette butts. Plastic is in your carpet. Plastic is in your furniture. Yeah. And we think it's in plastic bags at the supermarket. And that's like the least of our problems. Right. People are going to see this film in the comments we're getting. Where, first of all, every time, every time you you see food, plastic is going to get thrown. People wondering if there will ever be change. Tony's wondering if there'll ever be change. The, the film is going to, I think, freak people out when they actually see it. And hopefully it motivates change. And it's going to premiere in Canada and Vancouver, right? Yeah, it's uh, coming to DOXA. We just left South by Southwest. DOXA, we've got some other uh, engagements that are coming up, some exciting new festivals in Europe that I can announce shortly, I think. We'll have a premiere uh -huh. in Toronto. It'll be in theaters nationwide. And uh, yeah, just it'll be on CBC's The Nature of Things uh, as well in the following in the following year. And yeah, I don't want people to be too paralyzed by this. Um, I've been doing climate stuff, environmental stuff, as you know, for ages. And I'm not nearly, I don't know how come I can hear you now. It's amazing. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but let's just roll with it. Um, I'm not quite as freaked out by the plastics crisis as I am by the climate crisis. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I do feel like we have all the tools to unmake the problem. And the thing is, you know, you got to think just like your grandma and my grandma, they lived perfectly in a world without plastic. You know what I mean? So it's very doable. And um, I'll offer one little tip, if I may, just for anybody who's like feeling like, holy shit, what do I do? Mm -hmm. One thing the smallest thing, you know, people are always like, what's one small thing? If you literally turn, you know how um, a washing machines, trillions right. of microfibers, right? You turn your the spin cycle to gentle, reduces 70% of the microplastics going into the ocean. So that's just like, just what? one super dinky thing that a person can do to make a difference. But as I said, at the end of the day, it's not about the individual. It's about, you know, getting the, the you know, the man, the big man who's been doing all this stuff and polluting the world. So we're after them. They're the villains. Isn't it a lesson in life, though, to be just a little bit more gentle? Not even so much more gentle, just a little more gentle. And things, look, you know me, Zaya, we've known each other a long time. I, I, I'm, I'm not an optimistic person about where we're going as a people or as a species, but I don't need to be optimistic to care because I do it anyway. This is what punk rock taught me. So and metal taught me to do this. But it's it's just so simple that iron iron rule of ecology everything's connected everything's connected and I remember we you know we did an interview for the old talk show with with uh, Bill Nye the Science Guy and I was down here at his place not too far from where I am now in Los Angeles and I remember asking him when did you become an environmentalist and he said I became an environmentalist as I became a scientist because I realized you can't throw anything away because there is no away it's just over there exactly and it is a massive shift in somebody's brain but 40 so a spin cycle maybe i'll have to do that now my grandmother used to do it by hand but, by the way yeah well exactly but you're yeah. you you've hit on the key point which is you know environmental health is human health and we are made of the world around us right mm -hmm. like one thing that i say in the film is like we all know that we're made out of stardust but we're starting to be made out of microplastic dust as well so you know yeah. you know that when you know those the tailpipes out there that are emitting co2 your fingernails are ultimately made out of that carbon and it's the same thing when it comes to microplastics our bodies are actually taking this stuff in and and i think the shock and the horror in this film for me was when I started seeing, literally seeing with my own eyes, other people's garbage in yeah. my blood, right. you know? And, that's yeah, because that's the thing. You experimented on yourself for this, which is which is quite an experience, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we can. I hope we can chat more about it. I hope you can come join me at the premiere. I hope um, your friends who are watching today will be able to check it out too. So, you know, um, again... I, oh, I would like that. Hold on. I like that. I want to, I want to say something here. So Elisa and a few people have commented, you can see it pop up on the screen right there. I don't understand the washing machine example. What does, no. how, why is it just because it's not thrashing your clothes around as much? Exactly. That's it. So yeah, like when you've got it on, like, um, there's several cycles on the spin cycle. So it's all that friction, right? So when you've got it on, you know, one of those heavier, tougher loads versus like the gentle spin cycle, Mm -hmm. You're just not 
putting the clothes through that much friction and therefore you're not removing that many microfibers. So that that's just one thing that people can do. I mean, the truth is if you don't wash your clothes all that often either, uh, but I think people still like to wash their clothes and stay fresh and clean. So this is, this is another really good solution, but thanks for asking for that clarification. Michelle and, asks, what is the title? So let's remind her of the title of the film. I love this cool new technology that you have here. George. Honestly, like here, here's the things I like. I, as you know, we, you and I have both worked in traditional media for so long and I, I don't, and I don't, I don't want to do, I just want to, I don't want to have a show. I just want to hang around and do this weird stuff and, and talk and talk to friends about interesting things where we can do kind of whatever we want. And I love the way the tech has been, has been, and honestly, I'm just sort of learning it on the fly, but that's honestly I part know, of the I joy. Love that <laughs> It's, it's very cool. I've seen that you've had screenshots on yeah, and all that yeah, stuff. But yeah, yeah um, uh, it's called Pla Plastic People. Plastic, Plastic People, people a hidden crisis of microplastics. I don't know how much you can speak to this, but something that I find really interesting is when uh, my social media doom scroll turns into a bunch of people who are criticizing you know, the anti-plastics people by saying, what do you think plastic is? It's in everything is plastic. And it almost feels like they're, they're being too reality check as if it's fatalist, as if, of course, plastics, of course, plastics everywhere. I think the patent for plastic was filed a long, long time ago. Plastic, if you don't know, it comes from the word plastikos, which is a Greek word, which means to mold, because you can turn it into all kinds of things. That's what plastic comes from. And I think the guy who got the patent for it was ultimately a guy who's got a resin named after him as well. So just an inventor uh, and a, an engineer of some kind, chemical engineer. But th this idea that it is so much everywhere that I think everybody thinks if we can't do all or none, then we just have to give up the ghost and and ride it out until we blow the planet up. Yeah. And, and you know, I think we, we probably agree on this and I don't think it's an either or situation, right? Like we need yeah. plastic for some really important things like medical stuff, uh, you know, for all sorts of joints and, you know, different things that are required for surgery. I mean, I wear contact lenses. There, There's a lot of things that plastic is really useful for. It's the completely useless stuff that we can do without, you know? So mm -hmm. that's one of the things that this is really calling for. It's not saying that we can't have, and also there's a big con. The, the film really gets into the con of how we were conned into having to use plastic because the truth is we were trained to use plastic. For a certain period of time, there were people, you know, we had to, people didn't like disposable stuff. Our grandparents' generation, we they were taught quality. You know what I mean? Yep. You have that same yep. perfect model for 80 years. And the whole reason we have antiques today as a society is because you could pass shit down to your kids <laughs> and your grandkids. You can't do that with disposable stuff, right? That's just not the way of the world. And so when plastic started coming out in about the 50s and 60s, they literally had to train people to throw things out. And this yeah. whole notion of disposable culture was inculcated in, in society. And so we talk about that. We talk about the whole history. Very cool about the Greek etymology, though. I did not know that, George. Plastikos, that's what it is. You know, this thing, the, 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 I think... I, I do believe that we have some semblance of free will. I don't think we have complete free will because I think a lot of us, it depends on how you define free will and we have our own brain chemistry and we have lots of realities to do. And I think, you know, genetics and epigenetics, there's lots of things that we can do. But one of the things we talked about with Anil Seth in this Being You book is actually how much choice do you have? So we, we as a human brain, were so easily suggestible. And you're right that I remember when disposable razors was a marketing tool and my, my mother thought, why would I do that? I think, I, not to get too detailed, but I don't even think there were disposable diapers that my mother used on me that was still washed. So, it, that, but that's also how old I am, Zaya. <laughs> the idea that, that our brain can so easily be convinced that I wonder if the white hats, as opposed to the black hats, to use that, 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 that phrase, if you can actually reverse it when there's so much money being put into the con because so many people benefit from the con. Well, and the, well, the truth is, right. It's the oil and gas industry that benefits from the con because the truth is plastic is made out of oil and gas. And the mm -hmm. truth is the oil and gas industry. We know with all the protesters who are out there who are saying, Hey, let's stop using so many fossil fuels because of the climate. They're like, Oh, what are we going to do with our oil and gas? So they're like, Oh, 
we're gonna triple plastic production. Let's put it into absolutely everything, but let's make sure it's super invisible. Right. And so that's why, you know, your your joke about the meme about the plastic straws, that's why people get pissed with the plastic straw argument, because we all know that the straw and the bag are just a symptom of something much bigger that's going on. When you go into a supermarket and you've got your plastic bag and then you look around at everything in the supermarket that's right, in plastic. Right. right. And you're sort of like, OK, what's happening here? So that's why it's a trap. So it's a little different than a free will issue because there's a there's an actual trap that's been built here. And so what we really want to start to do is dismantle that trap. And um, I, I firmly believe, you know, we've seen it happen before. We've seen it happen with like other dangerous chemicals. That's the other thing too. I don't want to give too much about, you know, away about the film, but I mean, ultimately this is hazardous toxins. That's what the film fundamentally gets into. It's not even just the issue of, of plastic. It's like, what does this stuff do to the human body? I won't get into it too much, but I will say there's 16,000 chemicals in plastic and 4,000 of those are hazardous, right? And they're proprietary. There's a lot of companies who are not telling people what those, what plastic's even made out of. They're not transparent. And so it's not monitored. And so imagine how many of these poison pills are leaching into our, our bodies. What a and good night. You know what? I need a drink now. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> what well, is and, that? You know, You're civic. There, to me, I always look at the big tobacco thing and think, you know, part of the reason big tobacco came down wasn't that it was bad for you, was the cover up and the and who was involved. And I think we live in a litigious era. And I wonder if this is a key part. I need, I need and I want to say this because I listen, I'm one of those guys who definitely, you know, we did million acts of green. Uh, you know, I, I drive an El Camino that guzzles gas. And so the choice I made was not to have kids and not to eat meat, so, right? So I, I'm like, how can I offset as best I can? I, so I'm not mad at people for living their lives. And and I know that people who work in the oil and gas industry, I'm, talk, not, I'm not talking about the owners. I'm talking about the people who work there. I, people got to have jobs and that's the government's responsibility to get people good jobs and safe jobs and healthy jobs and all that. But I know that when there's the cover up, everybody, regardless of how you vote, gets smoked by the cover up. And there's got to be an element here that can be a wedge in a way uh, into this pretty big issue. Yeah, and that's what you'll see in the film. We cover okay. that exactly, yeah. So we've got whistleblowers in the film who mm. are sharing some mm. of the sort of information about what they learned. Yeah, yeah. You gotta see the film, George. You <laughs> see it, dude. I'm, you just premiered it. You gotta send me a link. But I'll, see, I'll, I'll, I'll try and come see it. Um, and just and to give people, you know, before I let you go, I really do appreciate your time. I know it's late out east. The, 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 between the 50s and 70s, there was plastic, of course, and it was in lots of things, and it was relatively, you know, it was present, but it wasn't as present. I think between the 70s and the 90s, it uh, it may have tripled in its use, and then from the 90s, I, I think in the early 2000s, I think it rose more than it did ever in a single decade than it had in the previous 40 years. So so there's obviously somebody benefiting from this, and it's not just a convenience game for us uh, that is doing it. So I hope, I hope people get involved. Um, I, it's nice to see you. Hey, it's so great to see you. I'm sorry that we couldn't actually hear each other for the first five minutes, but hope I'll get a chance to come on for another late yes. night chat about some other topic sometime. Anytime. I love, uh, this. I love this. This is great. This is fine. Thank you. Before you go, tomorrow is one of my is, is one of my favorite people's birthday. She turns ninety. Uh, Jane Goodall turns ninety tomorrow, and I know that I know that Jane Goodall is uh, you know using using animals using chimps has brought a lot of awareness to environmental issues and the state of the planet and climate. And you, I'm sure you were a fan of Jane Goodall. Oh yeah. She, she got the very first copy of my book. Cause uh, <laughs> she, she, I, know, she, I, I know I, you might want to get rid of me for another guest in a minute, but this woman changed my life. I met her when I was 21 years old and she wrote on a postcard for me and it said, follow your dreams. Oh, and so God. I, and then I met her and I interviewed her when I was at Daily Planet. And I told her the story while I wept on camera nonstop because I was so, you know, she is a true superstar, as you know, like an, uh, she is so true blue, the real deal, super integrity. I, You know, the fact that she works 300 days a year, um, pa all power to Jane, all power to Jane, all yeah. power to Jane. Unbelievable. 90 years old, 90 yeah. years old. She turns tomorrow. Uh, my, my favorite things about Jane is when I would um, hang out with her at some event or something like that. And she would have a drink in her hand 
whenever the photo would come, she would just very <laughs> casually hand me the drink and I would hide the drink behind her back. Because Jane can be edgy. Jane can be edgy. You sure can. I bought her. I won't say what I bought her, but anyway, it doesn't matter. That's I'll tell you separately. I'll tell you separately. Right. But <laughs> that's the thing. Like seriously, environmentalists are actually the biggest badasses there are in the world. Mm. You know, these are the people who are truly fighting the power. People like mm. Jane. Um. So yeah, God bless her. So okay. So in Vancouver, your film is May tenth. Uh, it's going to be the Canadian premiere right there. It already premiered itself by. And then what's the plan after that for people to remind uh, them? This- to be through Europe and then it's going to be in theaters across the country and uh, hopefully in the States. I'm going to be coming to the Hollywood Climate Summit and then it's going to be streaming on TELUS and then it's going to be on the nature of things and then it will be sold to people. And I don't know that part of that story because I'm just a co-director. Still pretty amazing. And, uh, and of course, you can buy The Reality Bubble, her book as well. So I thanks. it's nice to see you. Thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks so much. I'll see you again soon. Okay, see you. Bye-bye. Take care. That was fun. That was really, really fun. Bobby's with me now. Hey, buddy. Can you uh, can you see me here? I can. You got me. I got you. You're on there right now, and I'm going to. Very, very cool conversation. She's um, Zaya is really special, man. Zaya is really, really special. You know, I, 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 uh, two things come to mind. First thing is, if you really want to know what someone believes, don't ask them what they're willing to do. Ask them what they're willing to give up, because it's mm-hmm. way harder to give stuff up than it is to do things. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is, do you remember when we were kids and contamination of your body just meant the five second rule and yeah, whether or not right. that was true? That's right. That's like, right. If I got my ice cream cone and I get it within five seconds. Can I still eat it and not, you know, get germs? <laughs> yeah, that's a complete. We live in a completely different world right now, don't we? Oh my gosh. You know, the, the point about plastic being and everything and oil and gas and the petroleum industry, uh, mm-hmm. it's really very smart. She connected a lot of great dots there. Um, I couldn't help but think, you know, you know, you talk about what do you do next and how do you get this message across? It's a really big change. I'm going to take a, I'm going to propose something a bit of a hot take and you're going to disagree with me and then we'll see where we want to go. Okay. Okay. Before you say that, let me just share this comment here. Jesse, I still eat stuff off the floor. You have to, and I have to now because I also have a little dog and the dog will get to it if I don't, and I don't know what she can and can't eat. So I have become like a dog when it comes to eating food off the floor. That's really what it is. So sure, Bob, it's your dog. That's the, that's the honestly, reason. I guess I could throw it out, but I'm trying to be, uh, I'm trying to waste food. All right. What were you going to say? What were you going to say? My hot take that you're going to disagree with is the climate mm-hmm. conversation would change totally if the church made it a sin to pollute our world. I don't agree with you. I know you don't. You know but why? there are there are a billion Christians, and I don't have numbers, but if you look at the, like, let's say for argument's sake, 40% of the whole world mm-hmm. has some kind of faith. Mm-hmm. If people of faith believed that being a custodian of this planet was part of their ethical duty, as opposed to any other number of reasons, even self-preservation, because as we've learned, self-preservation sometimes isn't a good enough reason for people to do things if they think it goes against their faith. And I honestly think that if the Pope stood there and said, the most important thing you can do is get rid of plastics in five years, every politician would have to listen to that. Here's why I don't, well, here's the thing. I think that's true for some people of faith, because uh, as you know, I was raised in an evangelical Christian home, right? I was raised in a very, very devout home, a home that was so religious that it's not called a religion in my home. It's called a, a relationship. That's how devout it is. Um, one of the th- one of the hymns you sing when you're a kid is "This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures they lay on somewhere beyond the blue. This is temporary for them." For- now I'm talking about the evan, the evangelicals, right? I think you're right about Catholics because I think so many Catholics don't really live by the book. They just say they do. They're C and E's, right? Christmas and Easter. But I think for evangelicals, it's going to be tough. Sure, but that's also because of the political programming that's gone into this, because it's become equated with socialism, which has become equated with anti-religion, which is, yeah. you know, these two groups have grown to distrust each other so much that they see everything as a code for something they're not allowed to believe in. But in the beginning mm-hmm. of the Bible, 
when there's parts of the Bible that Trump didn't write. I don't know mm-hmm. if you knew that. Wait, you mean but, that Bible right there? Do you mean that Bible right there? That's the that one. one. Bible? Now, on, in his Bible, it doesn't say this. But there is a part where it says your job is to go out there and take care of the world. Mm-hmm. And you have to be responsible. You're going to have like these developed brains. You have to be responsible. Anyway, we can get into the theology of this. It doesn't even matter because as we've learned, it it doesn't like the ground game of the religious community is so serious business. If you need something done, go to a church basement and, I, it, and, and put it on a to do list. You know, I I'm feel- right. Well, no, I don't. I don't agree with you, but I, but I believe that you and I will talk about this a lot over time. Uh, over because, well, here's the thing: I, I, I do believe that what changes things are grassroots pressure. Can like grassroots is underrated, right? You know, when people criticize the left now, they're not really talking about the left. They're talking about the centrists and the rights. There are lots of legendary lefts who were Christians, by the way, Dr. King, they, you know, who are Muslims, you know, Malcolm X. There are a lot of people who had lots of problems with, with the middle, with liberals, right? And because they, they masquerade in a way as the left. Actually, they don't even really masquerade as the left. It's mostly people on the center right and the right who try to blame lump everybody as the left into one place. And that's not the real left in many respects. So there are all kinds of people in, 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 in faith-based organizations who I do believe are making huge change. I've, I've debated this with my family a lot because my mom, as you know, is a, is a gangster missionary and she puts her money where her mouth is. Her whole life is about being a missionary. And I try to remind her that she's in the minority, at least based on the ones that I come across over time. So I do understand that, grassroots movements can change things but i don't think the pope's the guy because because i think that most like look at all the christians who vote the way they vote it's not to do with the pope i don't think it may, may i don't know maybe you're more catholic than i mean i was catholic was a kid I went to catholic school but you got a loyalty factor when it comes to that now you have to understand what i'm saying here is not that it's not problematic what i'm saying here is it could happen that mm-hmm. you could mobilize people and you could, if this was a message that was front and center, it would get more traction than right. if it wasn't. Right. And it seems to me to be a great sadness that there are so many things that we could accomplish, but we seem to be fighting about like the motives behind them than we are the results. Right. And we got to get out of this motives conversation. We got to get more into a results based conversation. I think you're right. I'm really looking forward to seeing Plastic People's Eyes film. I'm looking forward to that. I think there's a lot. I mean, the fact that she put herself through it is interesting to me. I would have done the same thing, but I'm not as obviously I'm not. This is not my beat. She's so much smarter and she knows what she's doing. But it's a real thing to to, to put yourself at risk like that. You know, she did a really great job of uh, like putting this project together. It's very timely. Mm-hmm. And when you hear things like there could be microplastics in your brain, there are certain things that just become flashpoints. Like I know people will hear that and they'll be like, what the fuck did I just mm-hmm. say? Yeah. say? Right. Yeah. Cause I can relate to that. Right. Like I can't relate to the idea of a gigantic uh, Island of plastic that's floating around the Pacific ocean, even though I know it's there because I will never see it. Right. Right. But I'm going to spend a lot of time with my brain. <laughs> and if you're telling me that it's been contaminated, <laughs> now I might pay attention. Um, you no, know, you came up with an idea for a bit, and I kind of feel like we have a natural segue to it, if we oh, can. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. And you came up with an idea. You wanted to do something about Canadian stories, and you asked if we could put together, like, a kind of a gloss of things that are happening in Canada. And, so, and the name for it is, I will allow you to announce it, it is. So, because back on the old talk show, we used to do a bit called Mile a Minute, I've always yes, wanted yes. to do a Canadian roundup, and I wanted to call it the kilometer thermometer. And as you know, Bob, a big reason why I like to do things is if people react to it in a negative way, my instinct is to do it anyway, because I just think that it's well, well, it. So I you must going to do that. Like if I'm, listen, I just want to... I, I, I'm down here in LA most of the time. You're in Toronto. I miss you all the time. So to me, I'm just happy to hang and talk and keep people company. You know this. People are, there's an epidemic of loneliness out there. There's an epidemic of like insanity. I I don't watch TV the way I used to. And I don't want to ask for permission to do anything. I don't want to call a network. I want to do this. So I'll do whatever you want. If you want to do kilometer thermometer, I'm in. Well, the idea is basically, as you said, you're in LA. And most of us are up here in Canada and you're, yeah. you're pretty good at keeping touch in what's happening at home. I give you credit. You're, you are good about it, but uh, take the temperature. And by the way, if we're going to call it kilometer thermometer, I think we have to spell it like, you know, 
kilometer is M-E-T-R-E. Yep, yep. And the thermometer also has to be M-E-T-R-E. I like that. So I like that. Thermometer, thermometer. I'm down with that. Listen, I'm really into that. I think, hold on, let me try something here. Let me see if there this would happen. There we go. There we go. Antoinetta brought it up there, but if you spell it differently, right up here. Yep. Oh my God, is that the first radio sound? Yeah, the first radio. Just some applause for you. <laughs> All I do is win, 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 no matter what. <laughs> this is my favorite comment of the um, night right here, by the way. Hold on, that's my favorite comment. Because it could be ooh, or it could be just a whole bunch of zeros. And <laughs> I think I it's binary, George. They're spelling your name in binary. <laughs> that's right. Okay, so what do you want to do with the KMTM? What do you want to do? All right, all right. Let's do the first one. because talked about grassroots organizing. Um, you probably heard at the Junos that Tegan and Sarah spoke out on behalf of trans rights and against yeah. the Alberta government who are yeah. proposing what they would deem to be anti-trans legislation. Mm-hmm. Uh, released on the Transgender Day of Visibility was uh, a letter with 400 signees, signatories, uh, artists across the country from film and literature and music, and they signed it denouncing what they considered to be. Did you sign it too? I signed it too. That's amazing. I had no idea. Yeah. Um, Elliot Page, Neil Young, Anne Murray. There's a lot of people out there listening to Anne Murray who are probably thinking, you know, oh my God, what do I do now? Like, is, is she one of them? Yeah. Uh, Deepa Meta, just a ton of, ton of people. And I kind of, there's sort of two things that I want to throw out with this. One is, you know, obviously the degree and the hysteria around this conversation is very calculated and i was going to say it's not insane but it's actually literally the opposite it is the most sane thing in the world they know what we're talking we're talking about a very 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 small percentage of the population who are simply trying to figure out a way to live their lives and be happy yeah and politicians out there like they'll always they, they always do it they find the thing that they think they can make you the amazing thing is like they're treating it like a public health crisis like whatever but the other thing i want to say is 400 artists from across the country signing this thing made me happy because it became a news story mm-hmm. and frankly, we talk about the ground game of certain movements out there that are so powerful mm-hmm. and get so accomplished whereas people on the left can't organize a two-car parade so i'm just so happy to see in the middle people in the middle what about people in the middle they're the ones that can't or bright organize the two-car parade <laughs> Because they're too busy, they're too busy getting their own life in the well, world. They're going to the parade. Yeah, fair. They're the ones going to the parade. I mean, the <laughs> democracy is dependent on persuasion. All right, fair enough. Carry on. <laughs> so I'm just, I just kind of wanted to throw out that uh, I love it because now it has more weight. Because the only, like, honestly, my dream would be that this is not a conversation that yeah. happens with a left and a right and an us and a them. That's the insanity of this conversation. Yeah. Um, but because the right is taking it to the courts and because, you know, the premier of Saskatchewan is invoking the notwithstanding clause to bring an emergency, you know, session of a parliament, uh, you know, so that they can discuss pronouns as though, you know, do it about the microplastics that Zaya was talking about. I'm sure that's a bigger cultural issue and a bigger health issue. Um, it is such a small percentage. It is such a small percentage of people. And I think, you know, but, but a big, a big percentage of the conversation. Yeah, it's a huge percentage. You're right. Here's the thing. I, from my perspective, and I think I've heard this shared by lots of people, it is obviously a distraction thing, right? But what is our number one job? Honestly, what is our number one job if you're a little bit older? Your number one job if you're a little bit older is to do whatever you can to keep kids alive. You got to keep them alive. You got to give them an opportunity to thrive. And the statistics show time and time again, if there's a young kid who has, who is a, a gender dysphoria in any respect, a young kid who identifies as trans, they, the, if one adult sees them and, and, and really identifies them and, and, and is there with them on their terms with their pronouns, that the, because as you know, the, 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 the attempted rates to take one's own life are very high with trans kids, very high. And if one person sees them, that number drops dramatically. So if our number one, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you don't understand it. And I'm, I don't want to lecture people, but I just, because honestly, you do what you want. But except in this part, I just always want to remind people, our number one job is make sure kids are okay. And and if you're worried about, well, what about sports? Honestly, your kid isn't going to make the bigs anyway. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We Our job is to show our kids that we want to keep the most amount of alive. 
when you want to talk about unfair advantages, yeah, like do you really think that some trans person competing in a swim meet is the greatest example in the educational system of how inequities can be built up and leveraged against uh, a, a wide variety of people? The whole thing is built on like the, the colleges are filled with rich kids because who do you think gets the tutors? Is that unfair? Is that an unfair advantage? Should, you know, are we going to go out against rich people who get their kids tutors because it's an unfair advantage? The entire system is rife with with advantage and not advantage. It's just we've decided to, you know what it is? You've seen the movie Wag the Dog, right? Oh my God, have I ever. Yeah, this is the Calico Cat. This is this story is just trying to find the thing that can whip people into a frenzy and create an emotional thing around it. By the way, one last thing before I get on to my next kilometer thermometer story. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's also nice. I love it when artists do this kind of thing because we live in a time where the mainstream art out there is kind of like a shopping mall. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a time in the 70s and 80s where the biggest bands also had the most to say, whether it was Bruce Springsteen or U2 or you know Aretha Franklin. Like, there's any number of artists who became, you know, spokespeople yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. there's less of that these days and certainly the ones who are doing it tend to be of an older generation i'm seeing more kids who are worried about like sneakers oh the system is rigged well that's certainly true yeah that's right it's how about this comment right here i think you'd like this one my brain is 90 for 90 percent well that's funny because george has booze there you can pour it into your brain that's right (laughs) no no call it booze Uh, it's nice to see artists stand up and do stuff. Not that not that they don't or wouldn't, but right. when it makes news, it's always nice to see. Okay, think, next story. Yeah. You're not going to like this next story. Oh God. Okay. Well, listen. I, 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 bro, I, I, I'm surprised, I listen. I'm surprised we have this many people watching already. Like, I'm I'm excited to be with you, and I love the comments. Um, I like the way this is all coming together. So we're going to do this very comments because people are going to be mad at me for this one, or at least you are. Uh, okay, here's a quote. Here's a quote. I want for everyone born on this earth to feel like they belong here, no matter what, because it's lonely enough without feeling out of place. Facts. Amen. Can I add to that, uh, Miss yep. Cat? Mm-hmm. There's a way that this conversation has been kind of perverted, so that people talk about trans uh, people as somehow belonging outside of nature, like mm-hmm. it's not a natural thing. That the two genders, in a very specified definition, is exactly how nature intended it. Uh, and like according to who yeah exactly who? who gets to set those parameters like people were born here i mean they're part of nature like i think that what we have here is not unnatural but uncommon yeah uh, and are we going to call uncommon things out of nature it seems to me that you know it, it would be so easy to look at this differently and just say god what a gift imagine if you were just so lucky that you were born this way because somehow you had an insight that other people simply couldn't have. Like if we we could tomorrow decide that this was the most amazing thing and not yeah. some incredible burden and that one out of every 100,000 people or whatever, I'm making up a number, but like are lucky enough to be born to transcend gender. Like that's a decision we made in the values of our culture. It's uncommon, not unnatural. Bring it, Bob, says Karen. Yeah, I'm Karen. getting wound I'm Karen's a great one. Karen's a great actor. Um, I love, by the way, that you're yeah. getting wound up because usually I'm the one that on the late night live streams on Instagram, I'm the one that'll just rant. So, but yeah, I don't think you're ranting. I think, and this is maybe the thing that like Bob and I agree on a lot of things uh, politically and socially. We don't agree on everything by no means, but we agree on a lot of things. But one of the things that we do agree on is that it's that the space that we choose to create for each other is kind of the most important thing in a lot of ways. Because as you know, Bob, you're lucky. Because you get more than one life. You get the afterlife with your worldview, right? <laughs> I don't, so this, to me, this thing right here, so wait, Luan just said it's the plot of X-Men. Uh, X-Men. Is that true? Is what you're talking about, the plot of X-Men? Is that what we just... I don't know which one. I but, don't know. <laughs> Thank there you, Luan. <laughs> okay, kilometer yeah. thermometer story two. And the way yes. I'm going to try to do this is always one that allows for a bit of a kind of a weightier cultural discussion. The other one is just fine. All right. So I don't know if this is happening in LA right now, but and I assumed that this was a joke because it happened right around April Fools. But okay. McDonald's has just put out something called a remix menu, where they have taken four menu items and remixed them so that they're different, familiar but different. So they have four new menu items: a chicken cheeseburger, oh a God. surf and turf burger, which is two beef patties, one fish patty. 
the sweet chili junior chicken, which is the junior chicken with Thai sauce and the apple pie McFlurry, where they break up an apple pie and put it into a McFlurry. How serious are they? They actually got Lil Yachty to do a remix of the McDonald's song from back in the 80s. That can't be real. I, this is real? I, you know what, dude? I looked everywhere for proof that this was BS because I thought it had to be. But no, this is a thing. This is a thing. Okay, and first I, I, the McChicken cheeseburger, if I wasn't a plant-based eater, I would be all over the McChicken cheeseburger. Do you remember how much McDonald's I used to eat when I was when you first met me when I was 20? Well, all right, now it's time to play like, uh, you know, truth and consequences. Uh, when I first met George, he drove around, what was it, a Nissan? No, no, I had a Volkswagen Jetta. An old okay, Jetta. It was a Volkswagen Jetta, and it was not good. It was held together with uh, aspiration. And there were two things that were always remarkable about this about this uh, Volkswagen Jetta. One was that the bass was always so loud in it that the car literally rattled when we would listen to Dr. Dre. Literally rattled. Yep. And the other thing was you there was a parking tickets and empty McDonald's wrappers everywhere. I need you to. Everywhere. I need. You, I need you to know that I had so many parking tickets that I I, I offered to go to jail instead of paying for it. That is, <laughs> that is an absolute fact. That is an twice. Twice I stood in front of a judge and I'm like, I will never be able to afford these parts. You remember? I never. Be able to and I stood in front and I said, I will go to jail because I will never make enough money. But I have a philosophy because I'm a jerk, Bob, about this. I don't believe that I should be having to pay for parking on the street. The street. I'm already paying taxes. It belongs to me. It belongs to you. Street parking, to me, we should never have to pay it. So that was my philosophical point. The judge laughed at me, by the way, when I asked to go to jail. And he, he opted not to send me to jail. He opted. It's it's adorable, the fact that you just looked at him and said, how much do I owe? Yeah, I can't do that. Take me away. You offer up your wrists. I love it. For, I love it. Uh, I want to uh, go. Go ahead. Well, two things jumped to mind. Your next menu. The first, I think, is the obvious one, which is probably not a good idea. The food doesn't sound that good. Right. Um, but it's almost like McDonald's is like, they're like a married couple mm -hmm. that have gotten bored of themselves. Like they're bored of their own menu. So this is them like role playing. We're just going to role play this surf and turf burger. <laughs> Try and spice up Saturday night a little bit. By the way, you just unlocked somebody's kink by saying that. Like somebody out there is <laughs> definitely <laughs> just going to. But I want to throw this out to you because as long as I've known you, you've always been kind of a natural born marketer. Uh -huh. and you were always really interested on putting spins on things. I know, it's true. Don't you think this would have been so much more interesting if they did exactly this, but didn't tell anyone and just had a secret menu and let it get out on word of mouth? But dude, you're exactly right because the secret menu or the off the menu item is such an important part of the restaurant experience in the Instagram world. In the Instagram world, off menu is really, really special. That you're exactly right. That's what they should have done. Oh my God. Oh my God. Right? Like imagine if somehow it just got out there that McDonald's had new items. Everybody would talk about it. But this kind of, well, pardon the pun, but it force feeds you this gimmick yeah I, I really i really hope this wasn't an april fool's joke now i really hope this wasn't an april fool's joke i, I don't think so because i've been like if it is by the way i've got a good one i've got yep. a good like a, a stunt that went wrong yep so when i was a tv producer in sports everybody was coming up with the new technical innovations bob made the show off the record on tsn Bob and I got started there early and Bob ended up running the show. So it's just, if you watch off the record on TSN in Canada, that was Bob's show. Yes, go ahead. So as a gag, I said, wouldn't it be funny? Cause then it was always like, oh, you know, this camera, we're going to position it there. We're going to do all this. So I said, what if we had something called prompter cam where we said, you're finally going to get a chance to see the show from the view of the prompter. <laughs> and then we would cut to it. <laughs> Well, actually, like I, I uh, honest God, I wrote up a fake press release that TSN was proud to unveil its new technology prompter cam, and I had all these quotes about how we believe it's like the great innovation that will change your viewing experience around sports. We got a picture of one of the guys who worked on the show, a guy named Matt. We yeah. got put a batting helmet on his head and took a little camera and taped it to the camera and had him going like this. 
to the camera. That's amazing, man. Oh, we got a call back, Bob. We got a call back. Luann's comment was in the in the X Men. It was if trans celebrated mutants were misunderstood. That it was the okay. that it was yeah yeah okay yeah, I think that's true. okay that's so <clears throat> prompter cam the thing goes yeah. out forty five newspapers picked it up. I love it. I love it. Forty five newspapers picked it up. You get about a phone remixing call. journalism. You're remixing journalism. I got a phone call from the senior vice president of TSN saying, "The fuck is prompter cam?" <laughs> He said, I've been fielding calls all morning long from executives across the country asking me, what the hell did we just give you and what's a problem? <laughs> Holy shit, I love that so much. I love that so much. None of it surprises me even a little bit. Um, we're going to get... Okay, I want to get to Anil Seth in a second, but before we do, I just want to get your thoughts because I think we'd be remiss um, if, we didn't, if we didn't do this. Let me see if I can play this for you, if I can get it working. Hold on. Let's try this. <laughs> Saturday Night Kids, time for another monster chiller horror theater. Oh, oh, oh. And tonight, <laughs> we really have a frightening movie for you tonight, kids. This is really going to be scary. I'm not kidding you this time. This movie is called blood-sucking monkeys from West Mifflin, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and it's really good, so I'm not going to waste any more time. Let's take a look at this movie. It's really going to scare the daylights out of you. <laughs> that is that is the absolute best. Uh, Joe Flaherty passed away. Um, I know that you and I, when we first met, we talked an awful lot about how much we loved SCTV. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a gem he was. 82 years old, uh, passed away after short illness. He was considered by a lot of the people in the SCTV world as the funniest guy at the table. That came up a lot. It's it's impossible to say who's the funniest because you're talking about Martin Short and Catherine O'Hara and John Candy. Yeah, it's just you know, a thousand dollars of gold or a thousand dollars of diamonds, like just whatever yeah. you want. Yeah. Um, you know what I found interesting though. And I didn't find this out until much later because I assumed they were all Canadian, but he wasn't Canadian. Joe wasn't, yeah. No, he was from Pittsburgh. I believe that's where the blood-sucking monkeys were from, Pennsylvania, that's from the same <laughs> state. They weren't from Mifflin, but they were from Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, uh, Harold Ramis, too, who was from the U.S., um, wasn't an official SCTV the way we grew up, but he was definitely SCTV. Well, he was part of that first season, and he was an important yeah. writer in the room. Uh, favorite Joe Flaherty character? Um, you know, when I was a kid, I saw, the first time I saw Guy Caballero stand up out of the wheelchair, I pretty much, I think I was, it was, I was forged. I was forged in that moment. The first time I saw Guy Caballero stand up, <laughs> it was like the white suit, the station manager. Here's the thing. I, I ended up working in TV for a long time and still do stuff. And I worked in radio for 32 years. Uh, WKRP and SCTV are closer than you need them to be, right? They're, they're, they're more accurate than you want. But the Guy Caballero character, and of course, Floyd Robertson. When Floyd Robertson would have a couple of drinks in him and go do the evening news because he didn't think he was going to be on the air after paying Cam Floyd, that, they were for sure. But Guy Caballero standing up wrecked me. I don't think I've been the same since. How about you? Uh, Guy Caballero is probably the single funniest, although... Count Floyd, close second. You know who loved Count Floyd and actually in his autobiography wrote a chapter about Count Floyd? It was mm -hmm. Frank Zappa. He loved him. Zappa loved Count Floyd because he said it personified what he always said about cheese. I don't mean cheese the food, but cheese the concept and culture. The idea that like kind of like B-movie culture, you know? And he said the perfect thing that he was always trying to achieve in music was that moment when... Joe Flaherty, as Count Floyd, would look at the camera, realize this movie sucks, but he's trying to sell it, and then we just go, "Ow!" <laughs> By the way, let's bring in chimes here. You brought up Frank Zappa. We talked yeah. to Zaya Tong. Zaya Tong has that movie Plastic People. I think Zappa had a song called Plastic People. So right. Z Zappa... Zappa will come up a couple of times. Oh, my God. I loved SCTV. Before we move on off of this? Yeah. 
Sammy Maudlin, he was the fake talk show host. The weirdness of this is he just loved everything and slapped. Was there ever a moment on your talk show where you felt like Sammy Maudlin, where you just had to kind of coax a story out of somebody? Every now and then you'd get, uh, we, we would come across somebody who had, who is like Bobby Bittman, where, which is the Eugene Levy yeah. character, where they, oh, you, you just, yeah. you're, yeah, you just really want them to stay close to you and intimate in the conversation, but they couldn't help but being drawn to the audience that was in the room all the time. And I have no problem with that because some celebrities, the, the audience is, it's, it's tracking, it's a heat seeking missile. They're definitely going to go towards them. So definitely I would have those, those Sammy Maudlin moments, uh, certainly near the end, Bob. Certainly near the end, it felt like it came up, you know, a little bit more. Um, I want to, on Friday on this YouTube channel, we're going to put up our Anil Seth interview, our, our full conversation with Anil Seth. Um, I, I I read Anil's book a while, well, well, a, a while ago. It's called Being You. It's this one right here. Um, and it's about a, a new science of consciousness. It's a hypothesis in this book is that and you know, because AI comes up a lot, right? That AI can never actually replace the brain because the the human brain is about experiences and we're, we know this, we're, we're, we're wetware. We're not just a bunch of, you know, ones and zeros that keep the brain working, but this concept of consciousness. Uh, you and I have texted each other at four o'clock in the morning quite regularly um, when we both can't sleep and the, and the crippling reality of consciousness sets in. <laughs> what do you think about consciousness? What do you think about? I think that we are always conscious beings and a little more so at 4 a.m. Yeah, and dreaming is, you know, dreaming you remain conscious, whereas when you go under, if you're un getting surgery like uh, anesthesia, that you aren't conscious because everything shuts down. And he, I think it was a, an experience like that that kind of got the book going. Uh, Anil Seth is an amazing writer. Like, this is him right there. That's him on the screen right there. A uh, lovely young man. Um, and Enel has, uh, his TED Talk was 14 and a half million views. People, I've been in rooms where he speaks, people are mesmerized by his approach. Not just because he's, a, it's you know, he's a, a neuroscientist, but the way he brings it to you is so interesting. So on Friday, we're going to post this whole conversation up. He was going through an awful lot. What I want to do now is just play a little uh, a little clip if I can. Shall we do that, Bobby? Play a little clip. Um, yeah. So you get a sense of this, you know, who Anil Seth is. Uh, and and just, just a little moment here with that. It's so nice to see you, man. You too. You How too. are you? I'm good. It's Welcome. really good to see you. You too. Um, you gave me this book uh, many months ago. I read it and then I listened to the audio book again. And I'm glad I went through it a second time because there's a lot in here. And I... Just even the concept of consciousness sparked so much debate and conversation. Yeah, so just if people haven't heard you speak about this before, why the subject? Why did you, what did you try to accomplish, if anything? Well, thanks for reading it twice. Yeah, twice, that, yeah. That definitely deserves a medal. <laughs> consciousness has always fascinated me. I, I think back when I was a kid, it seemed natural to be interested in this. And there was a point where I think every kid wonders something like, why am I me and not somebody else? Yeah, and yeah. Where was I before I was born? What happens after I die? And of course, consciousness is the heart of that because that's, that's everything we are. That's, that's everything that matters to us matters because of how we experience being ourselves and, and the world around us. Mm -hmm. All we have are the collections of experiences of, of the world yeah. and of being who we are yeah. that get woven into some narrative yeah. over time. The story our brain tells yeah. ourselves about ourselves and you know, we we each read the story in, in different ways you know, sometimes it seems like we inhabit the same world yeah. and in some sense we do you know there is a real world it has real things in yeah. it yeah um, but our way of encountering this world in terms of not just what we think about it but but in terms of the colors the shapes and yeah. the, the raw sensory experiences that can be distinctive and I think is distinctive for, for each of us so we're much more unique, perhaps, than we might realize. How does spirituality and religion play a role in the way the brain works? I think they can shed light on what we're trying to explain when we try to explain how the brain works. You know, the space of human experience is, is vast. Um, it varies throughout the life. It varies across culture. It's varied across history. And there are so many insights from spiritual and religious traditions about the nature of the self, 
that it changes um, uh, practices that can induce change in experience, whether it's meditation, whether, whether it's prayer. Mm. I think all of these things can be very complementary. Um, the core lesson from both, that I think there are many, but one core lesson is that how things seem is not necessarily how they are, yeah. and that this idea of a, a single essential self is probably a misconception. The self is a process that changes. This, this is more apparent in some spiritual traditions yeah. th than others. Does it ever get in the way of the science? Like trying to get people to pay attention to that? No one trusts scientists anymore. It's what, not no, one, this you know is what really, is. I know, this is, this is, it may be right not to trust scientists, but one should still trust science. And that's one of the beautiful things about it, yeah. that it's, um, it's, a pra it's a practice too. Yeah. You know, it's a set of heuristics, set of rules. Mm -hmm. um, it's a recipe for figuring stuff out yeah. that ideally doesn't depend on the trustworthiness of any individual right. scientist. Does it get in the way? this dialogue with, with religion and spirituality, I think it can do when there are conflicting answers. I remember going a couple of times to speak in India, mm -hmm. and I think there's a lot of rich potential for synergy there, yeah. but it kept, it kept being restricted by this, this dialogue between what was said in Hindu scripture and what scientists were saying. It was hard to move beyond that. I hope that will change. But generally, we self-medicate, we we use social media that's completely hacked our brains in a way that people don't want to feel things, or at least that's what we're being presented. How do you combat everybody's desire to avoid that? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's a real danger, the sort of the consumerization of feelings themselves. Yeah, yeah. And we'll see this even more with what are called you know, neurotechnologies, yeah. things that you know, monitor our brain waves and train us to inhabit particular conscious states and, and, and not others and you know, in the limit sticking electrodes inside our heads. Mm -hmm. All of these can be justified on the basis of clearly good applications, just like the, the, the videos of, of holo avatars of Holocaust mm -hmm. survivors. If someone's got Parkinson's disease and you can relieve that by implanting an electrode in their brain, then yes, that's, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But the same trade-offs apply. You know, you're giving corporations access to perhaps your most intimate data, mm -hmm. the freedom to think, your own thoughts. Um, and it may change people's behavior in exactly the ways that you are suggesting, that uh, you get this easy out that you can, you can go for, but that prevents a longer-term process which is necessary for for well-being. Right. So I don't know what the solution to that is. It's like our, our ability to, I read a book and this author said that brains are just really good at problem solving. Um, and the problem is we have created so much tech that the actual core of our brain just can't keep up with it. Like our biology is not designed for all the light pollution, all the noise pollution, the constant scrolling, the dopamine, all that stuff. Our bodies are not designed, because we're still not, you know, if you think about it in terms of evolution, we're not moving as fast as this is moving. That's right. But we've been remarkably good so far. So, I, I, you know, there's a note yeah, of optimism yeah. here, too. With basically the same neural blueprint that we've had for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, mm -hmm. we function pretty well in environments which would have been totally unrecognizable yeah. to our, our ancestors. Yeah. People say that things are moving even faster now, and there may be some truth to that. So that things could be even more challenging. But you know, I, I think that the the wonderful thing about the human brain, and it, without falling into the trap of human exceptionalism yeah. again, part of it is its adaptability. Part of it is its flexibility. Mm -hmm. And as much as we're developing new technologies, which have the potential to be incredibly disruptive, there are also the potential benefits. That, that can accrue. I always like to think of technology as complementing our minds and our brains rather than replacing them. And I think this again is crucial in AI where the trope seems to be towards replacement. You know, let's make AI like a human, give it a body and so on. But no, no, the best systems are the ones that work in tandem that compensate for some of our, our weaknesses. How 
What do you think when you scroll through and see all of this manipulation and influence that is out there right now in social media and the way the brain works with it? Yeah, I, I mean, I try to avoid it, and, and it's, 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 but I'm sure I, I'm, I, I still see a bunch of it, and I'm actively trying not to see it, which right. makes it clear how, how pervasive yeah. this stuff can be. And in, in a sense, it's good that people have this drive to feeling better, to increasing well-being, you know, and thinking of life and health not just as fixing illness, yeah. but as enhancing quality of life, yeah. enhancing health span, not, not just lifespan. I think yeah. that's good. But you're absolutely right. I mean, how do you, how do you distinguish the signal from the noise yeah. here? I think there is signal, and I think there are going to be some good things. Um, in my own area of, of, of the brain, there's, this, there's so much activity and so much heat and light and sound about new, new tropics and yeah. supplements that can in, enhance cognitive ability and brain implants again further down the line. All of these things raise questions that are way beyond scientific questions. They're, they're intensely difficult scientific questions about how any of this stuff actually works. You know, a lot of it won't turn out to work at all. Yeah. And that can be known. I mean, that, that's just hard work. You need to do well-conducted experiments to see if these things that are supposed to make a difference actually do make a difference. Yeah. So that's the first thing, you know, I think. Right? Is what, what's the evidence base for any of this? It, there can be a very, very compelling story, but unless there's a solid evidence base, mm -hmm. then it's hard to have confidence, however good the story is. Right. But then, then there are all these other questions uh, about what level of change is desirable. You know, how, how much do we want to change ourselves? Is that something that should just have no, no actual limit? And these other issues of, well, social equality, you know, are, are, are we in danger of creating a cognitive overclass of people who have access to cognitively enhancing technology? Do you have a practice that you can, that someone watching can, how to start their day to, to feed their consciousness in a healthy way? Is, are there things we can do? I think so. I think so. I think the practice is very simple, really, which is to try not to take your experience for granted. Our brains are wired up so that we don't even notice what's going on inside our heads that generates this world full of color and shape and smell and beauty and horror and emotion. But it's all dependent on this incredibly complex electrochemical machinery, which is an everyday miracle. And I think just building in that practice of recognizing, even if we don't understand, and nobody, to be honest, nobody understands how this happens. We're just still you know, at the beginning of the journey, I think. Um, but the fact is it does happen you know, somehow. And it may only have happened once in the whole history of the universe, in one planet at one time in history, that matter, physical stuff, also felt. That makes it so much more precious um, than it might otherwise be. We cannot take ourselves for granted. And even a challenging experience is still an experience. It's still something. The fact that that experience exists is an everyday miracle. This doesn't mean that, that you, know, you should be happy about suffering. No, not at all. I mean, some states of mind are, are so negative, so aversive, that not being conscious at all might might well be preferable, might seem to be preferable. And there's a different conversation there, I think. Right. But That's why a lot of people take drugs. Yeah, yeah, you know, or, or commit suicide. Yeah. I mean, this, this happens, and I think that can appear to be rational. And sometimes it may be. Mm -hmm. The thing I worry about there is that, and I remember this from my, my days of being, being depressed, part of that is this feeling that how things are now will, how, will be how they always yeah. will be. And that's the other part of the practice. When you don't take your experience of being for granted, you can also recognize that how things seem is not necessarily how they are. That the, ex the emotions I'm feeling, that's my brain making sense of what's happening in the body in the context of what's going on in the world. But that can change. You, know, you change the way the body is, you change your experience. 
if you are sharing a conversation with someone, you're in the same room, recognizing that the way I see things down to the colors and smells and sounds might not be the same as what the other person is experiencing, even for the same shared objective reality, that can cultivate a bit of humility. And if we can cultivate a bit of humility about the most basic things, the redness, the, the solidity, without denying that stuff exists, stuff exists, yeah. but the way I experience it is, is coming from within. To cultivate that humility, I think that can be extremely helpful and necessary. If we can have that about how we literally see, then maybe we can have that a little bit more about what we think and, and what we believe, and we can collectively start to mitigate some of these dynamics of polarization. I think, you're, I think there's this, people sometimes often forget that the person you're having conflict with also has the trillions and trillions of experiences in their brain that, that they don't know either. <laughs> And that we're constantly expecting somebody to know something or figure something out or to be to blame. But unless you're fighting a computer and losing to Deep Blue in a chess match, you, this person also has all these chemicals and hormones flying around. That's right. I mean, we project color into things that just reflect light that right. doesn't have color. We project understanding into chat GPT that yeah. may, probably doesn't have it. And we'll project all kinds of things into the minds of other people. Yeah. I mean, that's the price we pay for communication. Words are fundamentally limited in, even for the most articulate person, I think they're limited in the fidelity with which they can convey what's in another person's mind. And of course, maybe that's for the best. You know, if we could actually tell what was going on in another person's mind, maybe you know, communication would be not only redundant, right. but social relations would get a, 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 whole, lot, a whole lot more problematic. I got to tell you, I loved having that conversation with Anil Seth. Um, Being You is the name of his book, A New Science of Consciousness. If you're hearing me say his name, Anil Seth, and you're saying you're mispronouncing it, it's called Anil. Something that Anil talks about is that he also doesn't know how to pronounce his name because when he went back to the home country, people said to him, no, it's this way, it's that way. And again, it's perception. So some will call him Anil, but when he uh, when he described himself, he would call himself uh, Anil Seth. Uh, Bobby, let's see if we could bring Bobby back on here. Hello, young man. Um, this book, so it's true, I read the book. Bobby, you're back on camera. I read the book and I... Listen to the audiobook and it was it was amazing. It was an amazing experience to kind of disappear into that world. I think Bob might have our speaker down, which is kind of hilarious, by the way. I think Bob might have our speaker down. Um, so let's see if we can get Bob back on. Can you hear me, buddy? Have you got me? Hey, hey, can you hear me, buddy? Should we just leave the camera on him? I think it'd be really funny if we did. I think so, like I said. Anil Seth Strombo's latest this book club that we do with Apple Books. You got to check it out. It's um it's available for you on um you can find it on Apple Books. Um, but our we've got a few conversations. You can find them on our YouTube channel as well. So Naomi Klein has just written a book. We had her on an amazing conversation with Naomi Klein, and we also had uh, Emily St. John Mandel, Station Eleven. We had Neil Stevenson as part of our book club. Owen King, part of our book club as well. We had uh, we had so many great, great authors be a part of our book club. Uh, Rabia Chaudhry, uh, who wrote that book called Fatty, Fatty, Boom, Boom. So the idea, the reason we started this book club and wanted to have these conversations was so that we can actually, you know, I can read again. Honestly, that was it. I found myself losing my attention span. I found myself losing my attention span and, and, and not reading as much. Bobby, can you hear me now? Are you back? Let me get your mic off here. Get you. I think you're muted. I don't hear you, baby. I don't hear Bobby. Bobby, okay, are you there? I am. Got you now. Um, consciousness. Uh, I was just saying that we started the book club because you know, just to, to read more and to kind of blow our brains open. But but listening to listening to Anil's point of view. Was, was really amazing. And I hope people can see the full interview. Someone uh, commented they wanted the full interview. It's going to uh, go up on Friday on this YouTube channel. Uh, he's amazing. He's obviously brilliant, but I think there's compassion to his science that mm. uh, I think would serve every scientist well to remember the whole point is to understand uh, the human world that we live in. 
the mm-hmm. physical world that we live in. Can I make a recommendation for your, your thing if people are interested in consciousness? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a book that I've really enjoyed over the years is The Way of Zen by Alan Watts. It's uh, an introduction to Zen Buddhism and various other Eastern philosophies uh, written specifically for a Western audience. I think in the years since it's been written, and it's probably like 50, 60 years, there's been a lot more of this stuff, but he was a pretty big pioneer in bringing Eastern thought to to Western philosophy Mm -hmm. and Western culture. And so I highly, highly recommend, here's how long it's been since I've read this. I found a a business card Mm -hmm. that in and of itself to uh, an internet startup (laughs) that I went and visited. (laughs) That is a long time. Um, by the way, uh, Bob, let me bring this comment on the screen if you can see it. Michelle Sterling, I can confirm those weird McDonald's items. I just stopped for a milkshake on my way home from work. It's real. There. By the way, if they wanted to do a real remix, you know what they should do is they should uh-huh. give you a shake with like a fries, but with a shake for dipping, because everybody knows dipping your fries in a chocolate milkshake is the best. Yeah, absolutely. A that's a re- that's a re- we have, um, we're at eight, uh, 828 comments, so it's been far more engaging than I, I, I thought it was. You know, when Bob and I and, and Tanya and Nathan, the whole team uh, working on this, uh, we've had a bunch of people help out putting this together. Uh, Daniel, if you're watching, thank you. Um, you know, we we just wanted to do something super rogue, and I we knew that technologically speaking, it was going to be an adventure, but as Bob will attest, that's part of the appeal for me. We've done it so smooth for so long in our career, and we do this daily Apple show, which we love to do, and it's much smoother. That we wanted something a little rogue, and I, I've really. But here's the best part, Bob. We've had we've maintained over 100 viewers per, so I love that, and I think that number is just going to grow over time. But we've got 95 likes and one dislike, and I'm trying to figure out the one thumbs down. I'm just wondering what it was you said that triggered the thumbs down. What was there? What what? <laughs> I think it was hello. <laughs> it was the, um, the uh, so I just want to say, hey, buddy, there's a Neil Seth right there. That's him. I love. Um, by the way, when you do that, like now that you have this technology to play with, we're yeah. talking about SCTV, Zaya. Uh, yeah. You're a bit like Jerry Todd. I feel like I feel like people Jerry who Todd. There's a uh, yeah. Ooh, a little video. That's it. Um, uh, Zaya, we're, we're going to wrap up soon. I think we're going to wrap up soon. I still, um, uh, but I appreciate your time. So Zaya and Anil, thank you. But I did say off the top, Bobby, we are going to announce uh, the next Strombos Lit. Actually, Tanya, let me just confirm this. Am I good to announce who the next Strombos Lit is? Let's find out. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for all the comments and hanging out. Um, you know, Let's see here. I'm just going to make sure we can do it, you know, because we're doing it in a partnership with Apple Books. Um, it's been really fun. Yeah, listen, man, I really look. If you want to see where I am, that's the camera from the rear. Hold on. Let me do this right now. That's the camera from the rear. Let me go like that. There's Bobby. We'll go here. George. Yep. I don't know if you know this, but you just said, here's the camera from your rear. And you brought yeah. up a picture of my head. Oh, yeah, well, I didn't mean to do that. There's me right there. Um, and we haven't needed to do this yet. Bob, we haven't needed to do this yet, but at some point okay. when conversations come up that are going to be, you know, let's just say a little bit more, you know, we need to explain to a younger generation. I can use my Supreme mic and we can just talk uh, to a younger generation uh, with the Supreme uh, mic. That is a <laughs> and by the way, if I needed to explain it to boomers, I can just speak it on a TV camera because this is the language that you know. This is what we grew up watching on cameras, if you ever had any cameras. So there's a lot of different ways. But yeah, I lost myself. I lost my mind, Bobby, in here just trying to figure out little cool ways that we can hang out. Because we do these late night live streams on Instagram, and I'm going to continue to do them because I have so much fun playing piano and doing them. But I wanted to kind of gather and just create a space for here. And and and, and listen, all jokes aside, um, all jokes aside, you know, I don't drink, right? You know that I try to live healthy. You know that my health routine is insane. I know that your health routine is insane as well. And I try to build, you know, you showed that book, The Way of the Zen, and what we read in the Anno book. I work really hard to build healthy building blocks in my head and to rewire, on, well, smash down the unhealthy ones and 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 assemble healthy ones. But every now and then, you know, my brain being uh, the place that it is, it's just I need a distraction. I want to I want to keep talking about cool ideas and share ideas. And so this show, in a way, I think this gathering 
is just good. Whenever we do it, it's just going to be a way that is just going to keep me healthier. <laughs> you know, because otherwise I'm not doing bad habits over there. I'd like to extend that to, I hope as we continue to do this, that people, people get out of this what we get out of it, which is let's be better. And I don't mean better like reprimanding ourselves and like trying to hold ourselves to a higher standard. I mean, like the best way to get better is to be happy. And mm -hmm. the best way to get better is to feel good about participating in things, which yeah. doesn't mean getting them right. No. You know, we've, we've confused, we've conflated this idea. We live in such a prosperity culture, such a winner culture that to do something can only be valuable if somehow you win or you're right. the best at it or whatever. And that's just bullshit. It's totally not true. Yeah. It's when I look back at the things that I really tried in my life, the things that have really mattered, half worked and half failed. Yeah. You know, yeah. but I didn't hold back during any of them. That was the common thing was there was no holding back. So that's how you get better is you just sort of, you know, give us your comments. Let's just create a space in which we can not hold back, you know? I think I think that this could be it. Like we, it's not a show. I don't want to do that. This is just, uh, you know, this is a place where, and again, who knows how often we'll do them. Hopefully they'll become regular in a perfect world. We can do them all the time. But it's this, this idea that we, you know, we've talked about this. I, I, my entire career, Bob's entire career, uh, most of our careers, maybe, maybe not always, but the idea has been go to bed knowing a little bit more than you did when you woke up, go to bed feeling a little better than you did when you woke up and maybe go to bed being a little lovelier than you did, uh, than you, th than you were when you woke up. And, uh, I, I think that what you're lean into is the thing that we do heavily agree on. It's why, it's why the Zen stuff and the Buddhism stuff works for me. It's practice. It's the practice that I think is really important in action. Somebody is commenting saying, um, I'm fasting and we're talking about McDonald's. Yes, because I put myself in harm's way all the time. I think about the stuff I can't have all the time. <laughs> I think about it all the time. Um, I'm fasting because I've had a lot of concussions. I've had six concussions and and they and they are not good for my brain. This, by the way, Bob, this made me laugh. This meme that I uh, that was sent to me, man forged head injury to get months off work and then returned to being rude uh, to his coworkers. Then he cited that it was just because of it. <laughs> it was a head injury. It was a head injury that made him ruder. I think I think that is super funny. I think that's super funny. That one really worked for me. I didn't get to show you this. I don't know if this is going to work. Look at your look at your name key, Bob. Oh, Bobby Panther. I like that. Did I get a little grenade too? Yeah, well, that's our little Strombo logo here. Oh, there's there's about this one. There's Nathan who's working on the show, and then of course we know that we have Bobby Panther. But how about this? So I Tong was on the show. I didn't get to use this for her. Um, but the uh, the Bob Mackowitz one I really like when these when these pop off. Uh, I'll show you that. So okay, we're done. All right. So Tanya said we can mm -hmm. announce the book. We can announce the book. That's what she said. So that's really good. Let me uh, let me get this off here. There's me, George Bisonwolf. Like I live like a bison, as often as I can get in there. Let's get Zaya's name off. Let's get Nathan's name off. And there's Bob Mackowitz. There you are. That's all right there. All right. So Bob, the next yeah. book we're going to do for um, for Strombo's Lit. Let me show you this here. Is a book called Wandering Stars. Wandering Stars mm -hmm. is this fantastic read by uh, a best-selling author, New York Times best-selling author called um, Tommy Orange. Uh, Tommy Orange. He wrote a book called There, There, which is really big. There's Tommy right now. So I met Tommy about, I feel like it's been a year and a half ago that I met Tommy. And of course, I knew There, There, and I knew all the, the the conversations about it. But I became really interested in him, lucky enough to have dinner with him and kind of get a sense. That's not why we picked the book, by the way. It's just, we just knew that Tommy was a really amazing artist uh, and an amazing author. And you know, what's funny is that we, we talked earlier about how I don't really read reviews, but I do like when people, let me pull this off here and show you this. You can find his book on Apple Books as well if you read on your device, if you want that as well. Wandering Stars. So I, I, I am almost done Wandering Stars. I am almost done it, written by Tommy Orange. It is a, it punches you in the neck right away off the top of this book. It is a harrowing book. I don't want to tell you too much about it, um, but I want you to read it if you want to participate in our book club. It is a, uh, like I said, it starts really heavy and then it takes you on a journey through some characters in a really interesting and really complicated and horrific time uh, in the U.S. Uh, from indigenous perspective, of course. And it has just become, it has become quickly, you know, but we talk about how I don't like um, all the time when you hear about reviews and stuff. And when everybody says, when you hear reviewers say, this is a really important book or a really important author, I, I'm always like, what do you mean? 
What do you mean by important? What are you trying to say by important? And then you read this book and you realize the perspective is really crucial in this book. And Tommy is a wonderful writer. He is a wonderful writer. So never mind the subject matter, which is also important. He's a wonderful writer. So Wandering Stars is our next Strombo's Lit. Have you seen the movie American Fiction? Yeah, it's so good, dude. It's every writer character who's a novelist is decrying the fact that like the white literati are always talking about how books are important but not well written. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're trying to say is this is important and well written, spectacularly written. And you know, we we I started this book club. We we talked early about Strombo's Lit because. You know, I wanted to read more and I wanted to get more long form. And I know that reading good books, reading great writing actually just feeds my brain in a way that you don't get to do on social media. And listen, I, I, we, 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 we love, we love social media. We play, we show memes and we know that we're all participants in it, but great reading makes your brain better. And if you're able to audiobooks are fine, not everybody can read, not everybody has the ability to. But the great, great storytelling, I believe, brings you confidence, makes you makes it more interesting, feeds curiosity. And uh, so far, we haven't had a dud on this show. The Neil Stevenson book was amazing. It was it was heavy. It was a lot. But we haven't had a dud. Yeah. And it's great. You left out something really important, which is when you have a book in your hands and you're reading and you're really into it, people generally don't bug you. Like people... <laughs> I don't know what it is about the act of reading, but if you really look like you're reading, like people who might have a stupid thing to say generally won't. Yeah. <laughs> They'll just yeah. keep it to themselves. So in a weird sort of way, it's a barrier between you and dumb. That's, I like that. I, I've never quite thought about that, but that's a very good point. I think more people should be reading at the gym so no one will walk up to them. Right. A hundred percent. Like if you're on the bus and you think that you might be in a situation where someone might want to talk to you and you don't and probably shouldn't want that mm -hmm. a book a book i love it hey dude um i'm not gonna uh you know thank you i'm, I'm not gonna act like i'm not gonna talk to you in about five minutes but thanks for for this this was really fun um and I'm, i know we'll do a lot more of it because i know this is something that you and i've wanted to do and tanya and nathan for a long time so uh this will be this will certainly be a lot of fun and i and i'm loving all the insanity that we can pull off with this, even because when you brought up the Trump Bible, the fact that I can just do that makes me happy. <laughs> just I could do that. Uh, you know, this is basically your brain, right? Like you can do little things and mm -hmm. go on a hundred. Let's see Candace Best. It's a good shield. She gets it. Yes, she gets, she gets it. it. Honestly. Yeah. Oh, Broken Banshee says that. And says, so what are you reading? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, Dude, I think, okay, well, listen, everybody's given us so much time. It's probably late. It's late in the East. Um, I'm. Uh, Can I add with a recommendation? Yeah, yeah. You talked a lot about consciousness and that extends to AI and tech and nature yeah. reality and stuff. Yeah. On this day in 1968 was the premiere of 2001 Space Odyssey. So I'm going to re recommend watch it again. Watch it in a dark room. Try to be by yourself. Don't be baked because that's a hack. That's a cheat. And just try to not think and let the pictures tell you what to think and see where that leads you. If you watch night, if you watch that movie again, you said 1968 today, 1968. 1968 was the premiere in Washington, D.C. of that movie. It, it's still eerily, and I guess Kubrick had this ability, it still eerily feels futuristic in a lot of ways. You know, it's really weird that a movie made in 1968 when the rest of it was like Ronnie the Robot, meet yeah. Mark Z, you know, <laughs> and somehow that one was better than most of the movies that come out now. Like Indeed. the Marvel actors need to work with that crew to help make their movies look better. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you too, pal. Uh, Talk to you we used to end every show. If, uh, there are no stupid questions, only stupid people asking questions, and the proviso that every episode could be the last, which might be true again. I also, oh my God, I can't even say how I used to end the old show. Do you remember how I used to end the old show, what I used to say? I do, yeah. I can't say that anymore, can we? This is back when we were Bob and I were... Secondhand smoke equals secondhand cool. Well, I know that was the nice one. I said even worse. <laughs> I said even worse. Yeah. Really, really good. 
Wandering Stars is the um, is the name of the uh, the next Strombo's Lit Book Club um, by Tommy Orange. Uh, thank you very much, not to Trump, but thank you to Zia Tong and thank you to Anil Seth all for being a part of this. And Bobby, uh, as always, brother, what a pleasure. Uh, Tanya and Nathan helped put the show together. Daniel, a whole group of people just kind of helped us and and and, in, and encouraged my insanity to do do it this way. So thank you. And thanks for watching this. Uh, by the way, oh, I should do this. Wait, hold on. I built one more thing that we can do. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. One more, one more, one more.